Okay, so at the previous lecture, we uh, introduced positive functionals on star algebras. Uh, we gave several examples of uh, positive functionals uh, and we prove some uh, simple properties of positive functionals on uh, C star algebras. So let's recall the definition. Suppose that A is a star algebra and F is a linear functional on A. Then we say that F is positive and write the following symbol uh, if it satisfies the following condition. F of A star A is non-negative for each element in our algebra. Uh, well, we already know something about such functionals. Uh, first of all, we know that uh, if A is a C star algebra, uh, then um, such elements of the form A star A are precisely the positive elements of our algebra. So uh, if A is a C star algebra, then F is positive, even only if it takes uh, positive elements of our algebra to non-negative numbers. Um, and we also proved at the end of the previous lecture that if A is a sister algebra, and f is a positive functional on A, then uh, first of all, f uh, is compatible with involution in the sense that the following formula holds. And uh, we also proved that f is automatically continuous. f is continuous. Okay, so, so let's now show that each positive functional uh, defines something like an inner product on our algebra. So again, suppose that A is a star algebra. At, the, at this point, we don't need it to be a sister algebra. So A is just a star algebra and F is a positive linear functional on A. And let's introduce the following notation. If A and B are two elements of our algebra, uh, then we define there something like an inner product uh, by the following formula. This is F evaluated at B star A. Well, it's clear from the definition that this uh, form is, in, is actually a sesquilinear form on A. This is a sesquilinear form. That is, it is linear in the first argument and um, anti-linear in the second argument. Well, also, uh, since F is positive, we see that if we take, if we restrict this form to the diagonal, uh, so this is F of A star A, and by assumption, this is positive. And so in particular, it is a real. And since it is real, it's a simple exercise to show that this condition the condition that the restriction of a sesquilinear form on the diagonal is real is equivalent to the fact that this form is Hermitian. Hermitian means that uh, the inner product, well, this is not an exactly an inner product, but well, we have the following formula.
So the inner product, it's a kind of inner product, quasi inner product of B and A is the complex conjugate of the inner product of A and B. So this is a Hermitian positive def non-negative definite form on A. Uh, in other words, this is a pre-inner product. And this form is a pre-inner product on A. So the only difference between a pre-inner product and an inner product is that um, in general, uh, the pre-inner product of A by itself uh, is non-negative, but it can be zero. Uh, anyway, uh, we know that each pre-inner product satisfies the Koshibonikovsky-Schwartz inequality. And so we uh, have the following. Um, Proposition the Koshibonikovsky Schwartz inequality. Uh, it can be written in two uh, equivalent forms. So the most obvious form is uh, well, the pre inner product of A and B, that is f of B star A uh, squared, is less than or equal to the in the product of A and A and B and V. Or equivalently, uh, this can be written as follows. F of A, B squared is less than or equal to F of A, A star, F of B star B. For all A and B in R algebra. Okay, so this planar product will be um, will play a very important role uh, when we will uh, try to construct um, <coughs> representations of C star algebras uh, out of positive functionals. Uh, so now, uh, now we're going to prove a useful positivity criterion for a positive functional on the C-star algebra. So let's introduce some notation. I suppose that A is a C-star algebra. And F is bounded linear functional on A. So we denote by F plus uh, the linear functional on its unitization given by the following formula. Takes A plus lambda to F of A uh, plus lambda multiplied by the norm of F. So it's clear that F plus is F plus is a bounded linear functional on A plus, and it extends F. We now have the following theorem. Uh, the following conditions are equivalent. Condition one. F is positive. Oh, sorry, I forgot to introduce some more notation. Uh, so uh, we suppose as before that A is a C-star algebra. And that E lambda is an approximate identity in our algebra. So as usual, when we speak about proximate identities uh, in sister algebras, uh, we follow the standard convention that um, these elements E lambda are positive and are bounded by one. And we also assume that our proximate identity is monotone. So this is the standard convention uh, when we speak about proximate identities in sister algebras. 
Uh, and suppose that f is a bounded linear functional on A. Then the following conditions are equivalent. Uh, condition one, f is positive. Condition two, the limit of f of E lambda uh, equals the norm of f. And condition three, f plus is positive. Okay, so this is our, this is our positivity criterion. Uh, to prove this criterion, uh, we will need a lemma. Uh, a lemma which is actually a special case of um, our theorem, uh, or more exactly, a special case of uh, the implication two implies one for a unital C star algebra. So suppose that A is a unital C star algebra Uh, and f is a bounded linear functional on A, such that f satisfies the following condition. f of one equals the norm of f. And I claim that f is positive. So this is a special case of um, implication two implies one for unital algebras. Uh, okay, so suppose, so to prove this lemma, we suppose that uh, this is not the case. Suppose that F is not positive. Um, and uh, let's assume from the very beginning that um, the norm of F equals one. So we may assume that the norm of F equals one. So we have the following equality. Uh, so if f is not positive, then we can find an element, a positive element A, uh, such that f of A is not a positive number. Maybe real, maybe complex, but is not positive. Well, uh, A is positive, so the spectrum of A is compact as usual and is contained in the non-negative half line. It's easy to see that we can uh, separate the spectrum from F of A by a suitable closed disk. So there exists a closed disk say D on the complex plane, uh, which contains the spectrum, but which doesn't contain F of A. This is, this is some elementary geometry. So let me draw a picture. So if, for example, this is the spectrum of A, and uh, for example, f of a is somewhere here, then, uh, well, this is a part of our disk. Well, I, I don't have space to draw it, uh, to draw the whole disk, but I hope it should be clear what I, what I mean here. So this is our disk. Uh, okay, so this is a disk. Uh, so suppose that D is the disk uh, centered at lambda of radius rho. Uh, 
Uh, let's now look at the element uh, a minus lambda. So this element is normal. And so the spectrum, uh, um, the spectral radius of this element uh, is equal to the norm. because the element is normal. Uh, but the spectrum of this element, uh, well, the spectrum of A is contained in our disk D and uh, the spectrum of A minus lambda is contained in the same, in, uh, in a similar disk, but centered at zero of radius rho. So hence the spectral radius is less than the big pole to rho, but the spectral radius equals the norm. So we conclude that the norm of this element is less than the big pole to rho. Uh, and let's now apply uh, our functional f to this element. So since uh, the norm of f equals one, this is our assumption here, uh, we see that, um, f applied to a minus lambda one, the absolute value of this, of this number is less than or equal to rho. But on the other hand, this is also our assumption that f uh, of one equals one. So we have this quality. And therefore uh, this is nothing but f of a minus lambda. So the modulus of f of a minus lambda is less than or equal to rho, but this means exactly that f of a sits in our disk G centered at lambda of radius rho. And this is a contradiction because we have assumed that f of a is not in the disk. This is a contradiction which completes the proof of the lemma. Okay, uh, now we are ready to prove uh, uh, the theorem. So first of all, let's prove uh, that uh, condition one implies condition two. If f is positive, then the limit of f of e lambda equals one or equals the norm of f. But uh, again, as in the proof of the lemma, we may assume that the norm of f equals one. So let's prove that one implies two. So by assumption, this is our standard convention, uh, the approximate identity e lambda is monotone. F is a positive functional and the pos uh, each positive functional preserves the order relation. So this implies that the net F of e lambda, this is net of real numbers is also monotone. Uh, also, uh, the norm of each e lambda is less than or equal to one, again by assumption. So this net f of e lambda is monotone and bounded by one. And this implies that it has a limit. There is a limit of f of e lambda and this limit is less than or equal to one. So we want to show that the limit is exactly one. To show that this is exactly one, we do the following. We observe that uh, for each element in the unit ball, for each A in the unit ball of our algebra, uh, we have the following inequality. So F of A star A is somewhere between zero and one. It is positive because the functional F is positive 
and it is less than or equal to one because um, the norm of f is one and the element a star a is also in the unit ball. Okay, uh, let's now do the following. We apply f to e lambda a and use the our cauchy bonikovsky schwartz inequality. So by the cauchy bonikovsky schwartz inequality, this is less than or equal to f of um, e lambda squared uh, multiplied by f of a star a. So let's look once again at our inequality. So we substitute e lambda and a here, and what we get is what we get is this inequality. Okay, but now uh, f of a star a is less than or equal to one, and f of e lambda squared can be estimated as uh, f of e lambda. Why is it so? Uh, this is the case because uh, because e lambda squared is less than or equal to e lambda by the first Griffin Nymark theorem. So e lambda is a positive element, in particular, it's a self adjoint. So it generates a commutative C star algebra, which is isomorphic to C0 of x. And uh, for positive uh, functions, uh, which are between 0 and 1, uh, this, uh, this inequality is clear. So, uh, so we have a lambda, e lambda squared is less than or equal to e lambda. In, and since f is monotone, we get this, this estimate. Okay, now we take the limit over lambda. And we take the limit, uh, the left hand side goes to f of a squared because e lambda a goes to e lambda. So this is less than or equal to the limit of f of e lambda. We already know that this limit exists. And this holds for each element a in the closed unit ball. So we can now take the supremum over the closed unit ball. And we see that the uh, norm of f, which is one, is less than or equal to, the, to this limit. And that's it. So uh, this inequality shows that actually the limit is exactly one. Okay, so uh, we have shown that one implies two. Let's now look again at the statement. We have shown that f, if f is positive, then this limit is equal to the norm of f. Um, okay, now, uh, no, two implies three. Uh, well, let's look at the definition of F plus. So this is the definition of F plus. Uh, since we have assumed that the norm of F is one, we see that F plus takes the identity of A plus to one. So F plus satisfies uh, the conditions of our lemma. And by lemma, this functional F plus is positive. So let's write this down. F plus satisfies the conditions of our lemma. And so it is positive. Uh, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, um, at this point, we, don't, we, we cannot uh, claim that it is positive uh, because we still don't know that the norm of f equals one. So to apply lemma, we have to show that, um, we have to show that the norm of f equals one. Suffices to show that that the norm of f plus equals one. If we show that the norm of f plus equals one, then we apply our lemma and we conclude that f plus is positive.
not by lemma, well, this would apply uh, that f is positive. Hence, f plus is positive by our lemma. Okay, so let's show that the norm of f is one. Clearly it is greater than or equal to one because f plus extends f. And to prove the opposite inequality, we do the following. So we take an arbitrary element A in our algebra, an arbitrary complex number say, mu, and we apply F plus to A plus mu times the identity of the unitization. Uh, so, <laughs> Uh, this, uh, what is this? By construction, this is f of a plus mu. So f of a is the limit over lambda of f applied to a e lambda, because a e lambda goes to a. And mu is uh, mu multiplied by the limit of f of e lambda because the limit of f of lambda uh, was assumed to be equal to one. This is our assumption. So as a result, we see that this is the limit over lambda uh, of f applied to a plus mu one multiplied by e lambda. So now this element is, is, uh, is in the algebra a, not only in the unitization, but in the algebra A, because lambda is an A. Okay, we we'll take the uh, absolute value here, here, and here. Well, of course, the limit is less than or equal to the supremum. A plus mu times e lambda, the supremum over lambda. And this can be estimated uh, as follows. So the norm of f is uh, by assumption equals one. So this is just less than or equal to the norm of A plus mu multiplied by the supremum of the norms of E lambda, but the norm of each E lambda is less than or equal to one again. So uh, we have the following inequality. And this inequality implies that the norm of F plus is less than or equal to one. And finally, since the norm of F is one, and since F, F plus extends F, we conclude that the norm of F plus is one. And now, as we, as we observed uh, as we observed before, uh, by lemma, this uh, implies that f plus is positive. Okay, so two implies three. Let's look once again at the statement. We prove that one implies. <coughs> Sorry, we prove that one implies two and that two implies three, but clearly three implies one because F plus extends F. So if, plus, if F plus is positive, then so F is positive. And this completes the proof. Uh, as a corollary, in the unital case, we get the following criteria. Corollary. Suppose that A is a unital C star algebra. Unital C star algebra. And F is a bounded linear functional on A. Then F is positive. 
if and only if the norm of f equals f evaluated at the identity. Okay, mm. by using this criteria, we can now uh, prove a useful extension theorem for positive linear functionals, which is um, a certain analog of the Hambana theorem. Suppose A is a C star algebra. And suppose that B is a closed star subalgebra. And suppose that G is a positive linear functional on B. I claim that there exists a positive linear functional F on A uh, such that F extends B, F extends G, sorry, F extends G, and such that the norm of F equals the norm of G. So each positive functional uh, defined on a closed star subalgebra can be extended to a positive functional on the whole algebra. Uh, to prove this theorem, uh, we may assume from the, very, the, from the very beginning that everything is unital. We may assume that A uh, and B are unital. And moreover that they have the same identity. The identity of A belongs to B. Because if, the, if this is not the case, then we just consider the unitization. Otherwise, consider the algebras. Consider the algebras A plus, B plus, and extend G canonically to B plus. So we already know from from the previous theorem that each positive functional on uh, A uh, on the sister algebra uniquely extend, uh, extends, canonically extends to uh, a positive functional on, on uh, its unitization. Um, so, uh, so this implies that we may assume from the very beginning that A and B are unital and have the same identity. And now we use the previous corollary and the Hanban extension theorem. So we apply the Hanban theorem. And we conclude that there exists a bounded linear functional F on A, such that F extends G, and such that the norm of F equals the norm of G. Oh, uh, I said, but uh, I definitely said, but I forgot to write that uh, in the statement of the theorem, of course, uh, uh, we are looking for a positive functional. A positive functional f on A, such that f extends G and the norm of f equals the norm of G. Okay, so, um, so now we have to show that f is positive, but this is automatic. It's automatic because uh, the norm of F equals the norm of G, but the norm of G equals G of one by the previous corollary because it is positive. Uh, G of one equals F of one because F extends G and that's it. So we apply our, color, our corollary again. So here's our corollary and conclude that F is positive. And this completes the proof. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, as an application of this theorem, um, we can prove that um, we can construct sufficiently many positive functionals on each C star algebra, which is quite useful. Uh, for example, let's uh, imagine uh, the Kalkin algebra. So the Kalkin algebra is the quotient of the algebra of bounded operators on the Hilbert space by the ideal of compact operators. So this is a C star algebra. But can we explicitly construct at least one non-zero positive functional on the, on the Kalkin algebra? So at this point, uh, we cannot construct such a functional. Uh, but this extension theorem easily implies that such functionals exist and there are many of them. So we have the following corollary. Suppose that A is a C star algebra and little a is a normal element of A. I claim that there exists a state f on a such that f of a, the absolute value of f of a equals the norm of a. There exists a state with this property. Just in case, let's recall that S, uh, 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 a state is a positive functional of norm one and the set of all states is denoted by S of A. To prove this corollary, we first consider the case where A is commutative. And by the Gilfan Marmic theorem, we may assume that A is, if it is commutative, then it is just C0 of X, where X is a locally compact Hausdorff space. In this case, everything is clear because uh, A is um, a continuous function which vanishes at infinity. Uh, so each such function uh, is norm attaining. So we can find a point X in X such that the absolute value of A of X equals the norm of A. And now to complete the proof, uh, it suffices to take F to be the evaluation character. Clearly it is positive because it is a character and it, um, it satisfies this condition. So this completes the proof in the case where A is C0 of X. And in the general case, In the general case, we consider the C star subalgebra generated by A. Let's denote it by B. This is the C star subalgebra of A generated by the element little a. It's a closed, it's a, it's a C star subalgebra of A. Uh, and this algebra is commutative because A is normal. So we can apply the Giffant Nymark theorem. It is C0 of X. And now the previous theorem. Uh, completes the proof. So by case one, we know that there is such a functional, such a positive, such a state on B. And uh, the previous theorem enables us to extend the state to the algebra A. And apply our theorem. Okay. So this completes the proof. Uh, our next goal uh, will be uh, to uh, discuss a construction uh, which will enable us to construct um, representations of sister algebras out of positive functionals. So before we discuss these constructions, uh, let's, um, let's look, uh, let's recall some definitions related to uh, representations of sister algebras. So we, we will talk about uh, star representations and star modules.
Oui. Ça va Ok. So let's recall some definitions. Suppose that A is a star algebra. A is a star algebra. And H is a Hilbert space. By definition, a star representation a star representation of A on the space H is a star homomorphism that's denoted by pi from A to the algebra B of H of bounded linear operators on H. And I say that pi is faithful if uh, its kernel is trivial. Uh, we already know something about star representations. Let's recall some facts. First of all, we already know that if A is a Banach star algebra, uh, then each star representation of A is automatically continuous. And the norm of pi is less than or equal to one. Actually, we proved some time ago that each star homomorphism from a Banach star algebra to a C star algebra is continuous and its norm is less than, less than or equal to one. So B of H is a C star algebra and this result applies. And second, we also know that if A is a C star algebra and if pi is a Faithful representation, then it is isometric. Pi is isometric. This was a corollary from uh, the Gilfan Nymark theorem. Okay. Mm. Sometimes it is more convenient to define uh, star representations in slightly different terms. So we have the following definition. If A is a star algebra, uh, then a left star module, a left star module over A is by definition a Hilbert space. Uh, well, first of all, it's a left A module. It's a left A module. Left A module H uh, together with an inner product on H. Uh, which makes H into Hilbert space. So H is a left time module and a Hilbert space at the same time. And the inner product on H is compatible with the involution on A uh, in the following way. So this inner product satisfies the following identity. So the inner product of A, X and Y equals the inner product of X and A star Y, where each 
x, y in H and for each element A of our algebra. By the way, uh, star modules in the, in the sense of this definition shouldn't be, shouldn't be confused with uh, Hilbert C star modules. This is a warning. Star modules are not the same thing as uh, Hilbert C star modules. Hilbert system modules is also very important objects. Maybe we will discuss them um, a bit later in our course. Uh, so at this point, we are mostly interested in star modules in the sense of this definition. Well, it's a simple exercise that um, star modules and star representations um, are equivalent uh, objects. This is a simple exercise. Uh, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between star representations of A on Hilbert spaces and uh, left uh, star modules over A. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, uh, which is given by the following simple formula. You have uh, a star representation pi of A on the Hilbert space H then the space becomes a star module with respect to the following action. And the other way around, if uh, H is a star module over A, then this formula determines a representation of A on H. So this is a simple exercise, but uh, this, is, this, exer it, it, this exercise is not entirely trivial. Because uh, what we have to prove here is that if um, H is a star module over A, then the operator pi of A defined in this way is bounded. And this is an exercise in classical functional analysis. So I recommend you to use some, well, important basic principle of, of functional analysis to show that pi of A is indeed a bounded operator. So this is important. Okay, so anyway, we see that the language of representations and the language of modules are equivalent. So when it is convenient, we will, we will freely switch between these two languages. Uh, morphisms between star modules are defined in an obvious way. So if we have two star modules, H1 and H2, star modules over A. And by definition, a morphism from H1 to H2 is just a continuous A module homomorphism. which means that it uh, is compatible with the action of the algebra in the following sense. And uh, an equivalent terminology When we uh, use the language of representations, uh, we sometimes call morphisms <coughs> intertwining maps. Intertwining maps. Or intertwining operators. In Russian, we usually say splitающий оператор.
This is an equivalent terminology. Um, we have the following simple but very useful property of star modules. Proposition. Suppose that A is a star algebra. Suppose that H is a left star module over A. And let H0 be a submodule of H. I claim that the orthogonal complement of H0 is also a submodule. of H. Well, the proof is, a, is very easy. The proof is straightforward. We take any element A in our algebra. We take an arbitrary element X in the orthogonal complement of H0. And we take an arbitrary element Y in H0. And we calculate the inner product of AX and Y. So um, by assumption, this is X, the inner product of X and A star Y, but Y is an H0 and H0 is a submodule. So A star Y is also in H0. And since X is in the orthogonal complement, this is zero. And that's it. So this shows that AX uh, is orthogonal to H0, that is sits in the orthogonal complement. So the orthogonal complement of a submodule is also a submodule. So this shows that each closed submodule is a direct summand. And this is very useful, a very useful property of, uh, of our module. Okay, uh, now we are ready to define, uh, to introduce uh, an important construction, uh, which produces uh, representations out of positive functionals. Uh, this uh, construction is called the GNS construction. GNS is the abbreviation for Gilfand, Neimark, and Siegel. Well, actually, um, the theory of sister algebras is based on two uh, important construction, on two important constructions. Uh, the first construction is the Gilfan transform, uh, which you already know about. And the second construction is the GNS construction. So both constructions are very simple, very elementary, but at the same time, they are very useful. Uh, Okay, so um, the initial data is the following. Suppose we have a star algebra A and a positive linear functional on, on A. F is a positive functional. So let's recall that we have a pre inner product on A. given by the following formula. This is a pre inner product on A. So this pre inner product uh, generates a seminorm. the square root of this, of the inner product of A by itself. Is a seminar. In general, this seminar is not a norm. So let's um, consider the subspace on which this seminar vanishes. 
and let's denote this subspace uh, by nf. So nf is the subspace of those elements in our algebra for which this seminorm is zero. Or equivalently, this is the subspace consists of those elements in our algebra for which f applied to a star a is zero. Clearly, this is a vector subspace because, uh, well, this is a seminorm. The triangle inequality implies that this is a vector subspace. Uh, we have the full and equivalent um, definition of this subspace. Of the following lemma. And F consists of those elements A in our algebra such that F of B A is zero for all elements B in our algebra. Or equivalently, this is the set of all those elements A in our algebra, uh, which satisfy the following. Uh, F of A star B is zero, again, for all elements B in our algebra. Well, why is it so? Well, the uh, one-way inclusion is clear. Clearly, the um, right-hand side is contained in an F because if um, A satisfies, for example, this condition, uh, then we can substitute A star for B here and we get this condition. And similarly, if A satisfies this condition for each element B, then we, we can substitute A instead of B here. And again, we see that, uh, that A uh, is in an F. So um, the one way inclusion is clear. Uh, to get the opposite inclusion, we again use our Kosciubanikovsky Schwarz inequality in the following form. So f of b a squared is less than or equal to f of b b star b b star multiplied by f of a star a. This is our inequality, and clearly this inequality implies that uh, that um, and f is contained in this subspace. So if f of a star a is zero, if this is zero, then this is also zero for all b. And similarly, um, we have the following, f of a star b is less than or equal to uh, f of b, f of a star a, uh, multiplied by f of b star b. And again, if um, little a is in an f, then this is zero, but then this is also zero for all b, and we see that a is an element of this subspace. So this completes the proof. Uh, here is useful corollary. This lemma enables us to define an inner product, not, um, the, not a pre-inner product, but uh, an inner product on the quotient of A modular and F. So the following formula. So this inner product will be the pre-inner product of A and B that is f of b star a. So this formula determines uh, a well-defined, this is a well-defined inner product on the quotient of a module and f. Well, indeed, uh, why is it well-defined? It is well-defined because uh, if uh, at least one of these two guys is zero, 
in the quotient, uh, then our lemma implies that this is also zero. So this is well defined. Uh, it is a pre-inner product because um, our original uh, form was a pre-inner product, but it is in, in but is, this is in fact an inner product because uh, if um, the inner product of a by itself is zero, then f of a star a is zero. But this means exactly that a sits in an f, so the respective uh, coset is zero in the quotient. Okay, so we get an inner product space. Let's introduce a special notation for this space. We denote it by, by H F zero. So H of zero is the quotient of A modulo and F equipped with uh, this inner product. Oh, sorry, the bracket should be in a different place. So this is a pre inner product. And this is a pre inner, pre, pre -inner product space. So we can take the, we can take the completion, we know by HF, the completion of H of zero. And this is a Hilbert space. HF is a Hilbert space. Okay, so this is, so let's recall that we want to construct a representation away. So this will be the space of our representation. Well, now let's con construct the representation itself. Uh, corollary two, corollary two of our lemma is that MF is a left ideal. And F is a left ideal of A. Let's look at our lemma again. So it's immediate from this equality that this is a left ideal. If A satisfies this condition for each B and C say, for example, little C is an arbitrary element of A, we can insert C between B and A and uh, this will be still zero. So it's a left ideal. And since it's a left ideal, we can take the quotient of A module and F and this will, the space will have a natural structure of a left A module. So corollary two implies that quotient A module and F, that is H of zero, uh, is a left A module in a natural way. So the action of A on this module is given by the following formula. And this is well defined because NF is a left ideal. Uh, so we can consider the respective uh, representation. So at this point, we use the word representation in the pure algebraic sense. So let pi F zero. So this is an homomorphism from A to the algebra of all linear operators on H of zero. So let pi of zero denote the respective representation. So the operator pi of zero of A takes each element B plus and F to A, B plus and F. So it is induced by the left multiplication in our algebra. Okay, but this is not exactly what we wanted to construct. Uh, so, um, so far, 
uh, this representation acts on a pre-Hilbert space, which is not necessarily a Hilbert space, it is not necessarily complete. And what is more important, I don't claim that in the general case, uh, the operators of our representations are bounded. And it turns out that in the general case, uh, they, don't, they, they are not bounded. But happily, if A is a sister algebra, then everything is okay and the operators are bounded. Now, this is our next result. I have the following proposition. Suppose that A is a sister algebra. And F is a positive functional on A. Then, uh, for each element A in our algebra, uh, the operator pi F zero of A is bounded. And moreover, the norm of this operator pi F zero of A is less than or equal to the norm of A. Okay, so let's try to prove this result. So we take our operator by f zero of a. We act by this operator on an arbitrary element of the quotient b plus m f, and we try to estimate the norm of this element. So we take the square of the norm. This is a b plus m f. So this is the inner product of this element by itself. Uh, and by the definition of our inner product, this is uh, F applied to, uh, I must take the star of this element, uh, B star, A star, A, B. Okay, uh, to continue this uh, equality, this chain of, of equalities, uh, let's observe the following. Uh, we observe that uh, the element a star a is, of course, it is positive, and it is less than or equal to the norm uh, of this element multiplied by the uh, by the identity in the unitization. Why is it so? Well. Mm, Frankly, I forgot if I if I uh, explicitly mentioned this property when we discussed our order relation on the sister algebras. But anyway, this property holds for each um, positive element, and it follows from the Eagle-Fan Nyberg theorem. First, Eagle-Fan Nyberg theorem. Well, indeed, a star a is positive, and uh, so it generates a commutative sister algebra. And it's clear that uh, if I have a um, positive function. Uh, on a compact space, so we take the subalgebra in the unitization, uh, and if we have uh, if we have a positive function on a compact space, and of course this function is less than or equal to the norm of this function multiplied by the identity. Okay, so this is true, and this remains true if you multiply on the left by b star and on the on the right by b. So this implies that. B star A star A B is less than or equal to um, this the norm of this element. This is the norm of A squared by the C star identity uh, times B star B. Okay, uh, let's now come back to this expression F of B star A star A B. So we apply F again f of b star a star a b is less than or equal to the norm of a squared multiplied by f of b star b. And f of b star b is nothing but the norm of b in the respective uh, pre-Hilbert space. b plus n f, the norm of b plus n f squared. And that's it. 
So if we if we now combine this and this, uh, we get that uh, indeed our operator p of p of a is bounded and its norm is less than or equal to the norm of a. So this completes the proof of our proposition. And as a result, we get the following theorem. Suppose that A is a C star algebra. And F is a positive functional on A. Then, uh, for each element A in our algebra, uh, the operator uh, pi f zero of a uniquely extends to a bounded linear operator on the completion pi f, which will be this extension will be denoted by pi f of a. This is a bounded operator on the Hilbert space HF. And moreover, the norm of this operator, pi f f of a, is less than or equal to a. And moreover, this is part two, the resulting map pi f, which acts from a to b of, h, b of h f, uh, this map is a star representation. of A. The proof uh, really follows from our lemma. Part one really follows from lemma from, well, was it lemma or proposition? This was proposition, okay. So part one follows from our proposition Well, indeed, uh, pi f zero of a by, by our proposition is a bounded operator on h of zero, and its norm is less than or equal to a. So the extension by continuity theorem gives us uh, the operator p f of a. Uh, and uh, part two, well, it's uh, first of all, it's clear that pi f is indeed an a representation in the algebraic sense. So we have the following quality. This is true because this is true uh, on H zero, on H of zero. On H of zero, P of zero is pi of zero is a representation. So this is true if we restrict both sides to H of zero, but H of zero is a dense subspace. So by continuity, it holds everywhere on H. So finally, to complete the proof, we have to check that pi f is a star representation, that it, it is compatible with the involution. This is uh, a straightforward computation. Uh, so if we apply pi f of a to say an element b plus n f, and then take the inner product with c plus n f, So what is this? This is the inner product of a, b plus n, f and c plus n, f. By definition, this is f applied to c star a, b. Now we can uh, rewrite this in the following way. This is a star C star B, this is the same. And again, by the definition of our inner product, this is the inner product of B plus an F and AC plus an F. And finally, we get that this is the inner product of B plus an F and pi of A applied to C plus an F. A stars, of course, A star, sorry, A star.
And that's it. So this chain of equalities shows that the adjoint of pi f of a, the operator adjoint to pi f of a is pi f of a star. So it's a star representation. And this, this presentation has a special name. It is called the GNS representation of A associated to F. Pi F is the GNS representation associated to F. Um, well, uh, in conclusion, uh, if you don't mind, um, if you can give me just about five minutes, um, in conclusion, I'd like to give um, an equivalent uh, abstract characterization of genus representations. Uh, first of all, uh, let's introduce some notation. Uh, we denote by lambda f map from A to HF, uh, which takes each element of our algebra to the respective coset A plus MF. This is just the quotient map composed with the inclusion of the quotient into its completion. Uh, we have the following simple properties of lambda f. Uh, property one, uh, the image of lambda f is dense in HF. This is true by, by, by construction. Property two, uh, the inner product of lambda f a and lambda f b is uh, f of b star a, or all a and b in our algebra. This is also true by, by definition. And finally, uh, the action of pi f of a on the vector lambda f of b is given by the following formula. This is lambda f of a b. And again, this is true by, by our construction. So these are the properties of this map lambda f. And now we can get an abstract uh, characterization of genius representations. So we have the following definition. Uh, we define an abstract GNS representation of A uh, associated to a positive functional F Uh, to be the following triple h lambda uh, h pi and lambda uh, where h is a Hilbert space h is a Hilbert space Uh, pi is a representation, it's a star representation of A on H. Uh, lambda is a linear map from A to H. Such that the above conditions one, two, and three are satisfied for lambda, uh, pi, and H. as the properties one, two, and three hold. 
So I don't write them again. We just uh, erase uh, the subscript F everywhere and we get the definition. So I claim that this uh, abstract uh, definition is, uh, is essentially equivalent to our explicit construction. So we have the following simple proposition. Suppose that A is a C star algebra. F is a positive functional on A. And suppose that uh, H pi and lambda is an abstract genus representation associated to uh, F. I claim that uh, then there exists a unique isometric isomorphism. Isometric isomorphism U from H to HF, where HF is uh, the space of the concrete genus representation that we've just constructed. This is not just an isometric, uh, well, maybe it's better to say unitary because th these are Hilbert spaces. There is a unique unitary isomorphism between H and HF. This is not just a unitary operator, but it's a unitary isomorphism of A modules. Uh, such that um, satisfies the following identity you composed with lambda is lambda f. So this means that an abstract genius representation uh, is essentially the same, or more exactly, is unitarily equivalent to the concrete genius representations, uh, to the concrete genius representation that we construct above. The proof is a simple exercise. So uh, you simply define u on the image of uh, on the image of lambda by means of this formula, and you check that this definition is uh, th that u is well defined on the image of lambda, uh, it, and it is unitary, and it, then you uniquely extend it to the to the completions, so you get a unitary isomorphism between the completions H and HF, and it will be unitary isomorphism of A modules. Uh, because of the above condition three. This is a simple exercise for me. Well, and finally, uh, last, the last exercise. Mm. Describe uh, the ingredients of this representation. Describe HF, pi F, and lambda f explicitly in the following cases. Uh, case one, A is the algebra C0 of X, a commutative C star algebra of continuous vanishing at infinity functions on the compact, on a locally compact Hausdorff space X. Um, so mu is um, positive uh, random measure, finite, positive finite random measure. On X and F is the integral. Uh, case two, A is the matrix algebra, MN of C, finite dimensional sister algebra of square matrices, and F is the normalized trace. This example was discussed at the previous lecture. And finally, example uh, case three, which was also discussed at the previous lecture, 
A is the algebra of bounded operators on Hilbert space H, or we can also take the algebra of compact operators on the same space. Xi is a vector of more than one in our space. And F is the respective vector state given by the following formula. So in each of these cases, I uh, recommend you to uh, construct HF explicitly. So it will be some uh, Hilbert space matrix associated to A and uh, construct the respective representation pi F and the map lambda F. Okay, so that's all for today. And at the next lecture, we, we will use gen the GNS construction um, in order to, um, to define the so-called universal representation of the sister algebra. And we will show that this universal representation is faithful or equivalently isometric. And this is the so-called second grafan nymark theorem, uh, which implies that each sister algebra is isometrically isomorphic to uh, a subalgebra of V of H for a suitable Hilbert space. So it's a real, it's indeed an operator algebra. It's a closed subalgebra in V of H. Okay, thank you.